So this, here we talked about electrolytic crystal test. These are testing the standard model and they were extremely accurate. Which are high precision measurements of uh, couplings and masses. Okay, so at the quantum level. So these essentially, they come under the basket, essentially they come under uh, these are basket measurements of high precision measurements of masses of gauge bosons, couplings, and other observables. So, which are measured at very high precision, okay, up to a percent level, the present measurements are up to a percent level, okay. So, that means they are sensitive to quantum corrections. Anything which modifies this part of Lagrangian has to satisfy this bunch of in data, okay. So, this kind of high precision you want to do it because uh, then. If you want to do any high precision measurements in a quantum field theory, you have to complete the loop corrections and then match it with the exponent. This, I think I told you that uh, the classical Lagrangian doesn't make any sense. So, it is a quantum Lagrangian where you can measure it at a particular renormalization scale, particular renormalization scheme, and so on. So, then we talked about uh, fermion masses. And we said uh, fermion masses are reasonably stable at higher orders. Okay, at higher order in quantum calculations, so meaning they are reasonably stable. Okay, because they are protected by chiral symmetries. So the only one thing here I didn't mention it. Okay, last time I didn't mention it and I missed it. The only one thing which is very very important. I mentioned about light quark masses that you had to measure it on lattice. And heavy quark masses of the heavy quarks, I did mention one thing. B quark and charm quark can be measured on pole masses. I mean, you can actually measure the pole mass. Uh, but uh, the only one thing you had to keep, uh, I said there are no quantum corrections because all the quantum corrections are proportional to themselves. There is one exception, and nobody has pointed out to me. One exception is QCD corrections. <coughs> So when you are measuring the top quark mass, say something like that, QCD corrections play a very important role. So we were really worried about electrical corrections. Electrical corrections are proportional to themselves, but remember the standard model has three interactions, three table theories, which are strong interactions, weak interactions, and weak interactions. So the electrical corrections are very well controlled. But QCD corrections can be very, very, very large. They can be very large. When I say some uh, uh, quantum corrections are large, that means they are at the order of 5 to 6 percent. Okay? Even 1 percent is a very large correction in quantum corrections, quantum theory. Remember that any quantum correction goes of the order of 1 by 16 pi square times the coupling square. Okay. So, this is roughly, if the coupling is of order 1, this is roughly 1 percent. Okay. So, this is typically your order of magnitude for any quantum correction. Okay. Now, for any quantum correction, you would say that in, uh, very large quantum correction is 1 percent, that means the coupling is very, very large. Of course, there are log factors and everything and other things which can push it up further. But if the coupling is larger than one, say, 
pretty pretty close to uh, larger than one or something. This coupling happens for QCD. The QCD corrections of the top four mass are at about 5%. If you given renormalization scale. QCD corrections of other crops are also pretty much the same. QCD corrections are universal. They are about 5%. Okay? But we take for top because top plays a very big role in everything else. 5% of 200 GeV is very large compared to 5% of 5 GeV. Okay? So, the, okay? so these masses run. Okay? Depending, I'll come to that in one second when I do the ECOP. One second I'll I'll just come to this one. So the top part mass correction. So typically, if somebody says and we pull in MS bar or something, or scale, empty pole, <coughs> there is no empty pole in real sense. Okay, what they call is an extracted empty pole or something. There are some complications regarding this, which we can talk about it uh, later on. Empty MS bar, say for example. Vp, say 172 or something, 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 times, say, or uh, <coughs> into 0 0.09. Uh, so, this is a 5% error bar of coming from this correction. Okay, so this QCD correction typically goes as alpha s. Times. This has a standard fraction uh, log uh, mu by some scale. So this coupling strength is also running. This coupling strength also is running with, re with respect to energy. I'll come to that in a second. Everything runs. Quantum field theory, in a quantum field theory, there is nothing which is scale independent. Okay? Everything runs with an energy. Changes with energy. Changes with energy. This correction also changes. So when you are doing the correction, you have to tell at what scale you are doing that correction. At what scale of renormalization you are doing that correction. So now that I have mentioned this, I'll just directly jump into this in one second. Uh, so what happens? Uh, oh, okay, uh, I'll jump to this. So now, now let's consider uh, this part is done, chromium part, and now we consider the cover part. The curve part essentially gives you the masses, right? Like that thing in the okay. So it is say uh, QL bar U times uh, plus Y I J Q D. I J U bar D R H tilde This tilde is the opposite hypercharge. So what is this notation? This notation, uh, the moment things get the vacuum expectation value, when you write, uh, uh, let's write this in, in the gauge in which you link, the light Higgs is there and it has a vacuum expectation value. And that gauge is called unitary gauge. Okay, in unitary gauge, <coughs> the 
this gives you <coughs> y u i j q bar u r or u n bar u r i j b plus h plus y d you carry gauge is a gauge in which there are no Goldstone bosons. The Goldstone bosons are taken in. Okay. That's only the process. DL bar I, DR bar J, B plus H, uh, Y E, I J, DL bar I, DR bar J, So at the starting level, these couplings are non I meaning they couple, they have off diagonal terms. The car couplings are off diagonal. That means you cannot define properly the masses in terms of the car coupling. Only in the diagonal basis they can be defined. Okay. So the Higgs coupling can also be off diagonal. Any questions on this? Yeah, you have some questions? Okay, nothing. Okay, so now I diagonalize. The way I diagonalize is I take all the three generations of the non type, all the three generations of the off type. So how many fields are there? 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay. There is VUL, VUR, uh, UR, DL, DR. So you need four mixing matrices. Because this is a complex generic matrix. That means it may not be com complex symmetric. It's not complex symmetric, it's not unitary. Okay. So uh, the theorem in layer, uh, what do you call it? Linear algebra that a complex generic matrix needs to be diagonalized by biunitary transformation. Okay, so biunitary means you need two, uh, two unitary matrices to diagonalize. You can always go any complex matrix, you can always diagonalize it. <coughs> any complex matrix M by V and U. Okay, so that means this V will apply on these fields, R will apply on these fields. So there is a rotation on this side, there is a rotation on this side. Okay, so I call these matrices as VUL acting on uh, first one is UL1, UL2, UL3. And then we are acting as you are one, you are two, you are three. Acting on this should be give me some form you are prime, you are two prime, you are three prime. You will one prime, you will two prime, you will three prime. <clears throat> now this rotation I shouldn't stop. Okay? When I do this. This first term, I am assuming, putting the condition that y u i j uh, 
Okay, I choose my VUL, I choose my VUR such that this equation is satisfied. Such that this equation is satisfied. Okay, so I am rotating this into a basis where this matrix is diagonal. Okay, this matrix is diagonal. And that I can always do. That I can always do because of the theorem of Lehman algebra. Okay. So same thing I can do for here, same thing I can do for here. Um, can there be one more equation like V U R dagger Y U and V U L? That will also diagonal. Uh, it won't be the same V U and V L. Meaning you have to choose. Look. Say for example, I choose V U. Bar here. Mm, okay, yeah. That's the reason why I put a diagonal. Okay. Mm. Okay. So then I have similar matrices for a, uh, here. I have V B L. Uh, what did you call it? VDL, VDR, which will take me, which will take these rotations will take me YD to YD diagonal. Similarly, I have VDL and VDR, which will take YE to YT diagonal. Now when you do that, your Ikawa part of the Lagrangian is completely diagonal. Okay, the Ikawa part of the Lagrangian is completely diagonal, and so now you can define your mass assumption. This IJ sum is over the generation. Over the generation. Okay. So standard model has some generational mixing. And that generation mixing is only coming from the cars. There is no other source of generation mixing. The kinetic terms do not have generation mixing, but the source from the cars can get generated, transformed into into the kinetic terms, meaning in terms of the interactions. That's what I'm trying to show. After we calculate, then this. There's no, uh, the Higgs will not have any level change in neutral currents. Mm -hmm. okay. But there is still energy. At the tree level, yeah. Yeah, uh, I mean, still, uh, I mean, mixes the left and the right. Uh, Higgs always mixes left and right. Higgs, by definition, will always mix left and right mm -hmm. because it's a chiral interaction. Mm -hmm. Okay. But if you want a mass term, then you We need left and right, no? In chiral basis, uh, anyway, if you write in terms of chiral basis, m psi bar psi will become psi l bar. Uh, right. So that's the reason in the chiral basis, because we are in the chiral theory, we, can, we have to see it this way. Instead of this way, we see it. If they are vector theories, <coughs> you can write a bare mass term. You don't need a Higgs mass term. In standard model, there are no vector like particles. All of them are current particles. We will see in the standard model, there are many cases in which vector like particles are. I'll tell you what's the distinction of vector like particles and current like particles in a second. Uh, okay, I'll just tell you right away. So, vector like particles is that now psi l bar psi r breaks the gate symmetry. Because only psi l participates in the weak interaction, psi r 
doesn't participate in the meeting. Now suppose I say that Sayar also is participating in the meeting actually, in the same way as Sayar. Okay? Or in a way such that it compensates the Sayar information. Then this master will not delegate some meeting. Okay? So formulas which are charged under SU2, okay, under SU2 of the standard model, in which both left hand, right hand components transform as doublets, those are called vector link So this entire basis, uh, this Lagrangian, becomes by u diag, u l i bar u r i d plus h by d diag. Li plus H plus Y E by R E L I by R I Li plus H. These are not uh, the original fields we are talking about, right? Are these, these are called mass physical fields. Okay. So, if you want, these are, to use the nomenclature, these are your gauge fields. Sometimes called gauge fields, which is not. And uh, these are called physical fields or mass bases. So, this is different bases. These are, okay, did you say? Gauge basis because in this basis, as we will see, <coughs> this Lagrangian is diagonal in the gauge basis. So to start with, this Lagrangian is diagonal. But now, if you make this part of the Lagrangian diagonal, this Lagrangian is no longer diagonal. Okay, so now I have made it this Lagrangian to be diagonal, okay? Now, I will do the same, let's go back to L formula. So, L formula Just generally wrote it as psi bar i, i del slash psi. That's all. Right? We wrote it as this. Where d slash is equal to i del mu w mu a tau a by 2. And then This is some sort of a direct product. This space is different from this space. This space is completely different, so we forget about it. This is the colored space. Okay, this is the colored space. So I just put a direct product. This is the colored space in which every u, 1, r, 2, uh, r1, rg, rg, transform. Okay, now if you look at this. Thing, it is the same field which appears here and here. 
left and left is the same field which appears here and here. Okay, let's take one particular thing. Let's take the gluon part. The gluon part will be psi gluon, uh, psi bar, del mu minus g mu a lambda a plus q. First of all, <coughs> this psi, this psi i is colors red, blue, and green, red, uh, green, and blue. And when they go into the basis, u1 r, u1 g, u r g p, they just go to u1 prime. R, C1 prime, B, C1 prime, B. So directly in the physical basis, this term is invariant. So you can replace whatever use you have by the same physical phase. There is no difference. Okay? So as far as the, this is true for all the colors, up type, down type, both, uh, all the six flavors. This won't make a difference, so I'll just remove this thing. We all agree with this because that space is different, that's a color space. Okay, each U will have three different colors. So that's really different. So now let's come to this part. Since it's the same field which you appear on both sides, two unitary transformations. You would expect that nothing would change here also. Many will be the kinetic term will just go there. Do you agree with this? So this W mu will have another term actually. W mu something and tau. I mean W mu A tau. Yeah. Do you agree with this? If I write psi in terms of psi prime basis, will it go through? For right handed fields, d slash would be what? d slash will be curly sorry. They won't have a W. <coughs> now, in particular, what happens is <clears throat> this, uh, what happens is the moment it is broken, the mass term, the mass fields, the E prime basis, <clears throat> the E prime basis looks like it's purely left handed, purely right handed, but there could be some couplings which mix left and right. There could be some couplings. Which mix left and right. How that happens? So you write all the terms with left handed, you write all the terms with right handed. But when you break the symmetry, when you break the symmetry, there are two new linear combinations come. This is something which you were asking the video. The 
physical fields are W mu plus minus W mu one and W mu three sorry W mu three two is equal to Z mu gamma mu. Now let me write the kinetic terms in this basis. The moment I write kinetic terms in this basis. Remember, V mu couples not just to left handed fields, it also couples to right handed fields. So, this linear combination of V mu, this linear combination of V mu, okay, for W plus it doesn't matter, okay, for W plus it doesn't matter, okay. <coughs> okay. This linear combination of V mu and everything, it all. There is also one more problem. Now look at uh, okay, there are, okay, there are just too many things. Okay, let's look at this one. This coupling, okay, we can do it very simply actually. Let's I'll come to this part once again. Um, okay, uh, this linear uh, okay, there are this linear combination. Now uh, maybe I can just do it without introducing this linear combination. I will come to this one second, uh, just hold on this thought and I will come to this one. Now this one, let us expand this one for the first kinetic term which is Q dagger del mu slash Q. Q dagger del mu dash Q. Okay. So the rotations not only distinguish between left and right fields, but they also distinguish between uptype and downtype fields. So the uptype fields will have a rotation u u l and the downtype fields will have a rotation v d l. But what this coupling for the w does, let us look at the coupling of the w. The w has a tau 3 in it, so tau 1 plus tau 2, tau 3, tau 3. So what it does, this entire coupling if q is equal to U L J L. So this is Q bar I del mu G W mu A W mu one tau one. What is tau one? Plus tau two. plus tau 3 q. Now q is what? u bar l v l bar u l v l. So the first term okay, is nothing but u l bar i del mu u l minus v l bar i del mu v l. That is first term, the derivative terms are the same. But if you look at the tau interaction, what is it taking? It is taking u l to v l. W plus. So W this you can write it as W1 plus W2, this combination which I have given. Okay? So this combination I write it as I G W mu mu plus let's say C. 
So this gives me this combination. I'm just using this combination. So this gives me I G U L bar that is gamma mu. Sorry, let's say gamma mu here. D L W mu plus let's say C. Now this I can generalize by putting I here, I, J, or I, I. <coughs> this also I, I. Okay. Then there is minus g t3 minus y sin square t theta w g prime okay if i don't write it down by the two this is the rotation of w3 to b mu I am combining two couplings. Okay. This will have U L bar I U L bar I uh, bar times Z mu and the opposite linear combination. And this also holds true for left hand and right hand. Now the left and right mixing, the left and right mixing will not play any role in the Z coupling. It plays a role in the Z coupling, it mixes. But they come individually. Each L will come individually, each R will come individually. Okay? For the right handed part, P3 is equal to 0. Okay? For right handed part, there is a coupling here, sorry. It's an opposite linear combination, I didn't write it down. Okay? That's nothing but the automatic coupling. For the arms, P3 is equal to 0. It doesn't happen. So, for the arms, P3 is equal to 0. For the left handed parts, P3 minus y by 2 sub sin theta will do something. Times the z mu capital. And the same thing for A mu. Now you rotate this. Now you go into the basis of the primed basis. Now if you go into the primed basis, everywhere you have to put a VL. VL, VL. It will just go through. VL dagger VL is equal to 1. This will just remain the same form. DL power VL, same. Okay, it's same matrix will come on the left hand side and on the right hand side. So you can unitize. The unitary condition will make it. You can just replace it with the prime cubes. Here, you cannot replace it with the prime cubes. Problem comes because VUL, VDL dagger comes. Or VUL dagger, VDL comes. There is a mismatch because the left handed fields of the down sector and the left handed fields of the up sector have different rotation. If the symmetry is not broken, the left handed fields of the down sector and the left handed fields of the right handed sector will be rotated by the same matrix. But because the symmetry is broken, the left handed fields of the right sector and the left handed fields of the down sector are rotated differently because they come from two different decor couplings. Okay? So this is the famous CPM model.
And now you have this. So here, if I put a prime, you get a CKM matrix. Here, you can directly go through a prime with this because they, these fields are the same field. Whether it's left or right, there's a distinction. Okay? Except in the coupling value. The left couples differently to the Z, the right couples differently to the Z, but they don't introduce three level flavor changing neutral colors. So, this is a famous statement that you don't have any three level flavor changing neutral currents in the standard model. The only flavor changing neutral currents are charge currents pro produced by the W. But this is not true at one loop level. At the quantum Lagrangian, there are one loops, flavor changing neutral currents. FCNC means flavor changing neutral currents. So, if any BSM model, if any BSM model modifies this, so what are the two neutral currents in the standard model? Z, photon, and Higgs. Higgs also doesn't introduce any flavor changing neutral current. This is very important. The Higgs also we wrote down the couplings previously. It doesn't have any pre level changing flavor changing. And this aspect of the standard model can be easily modified in a BSM model. Any BSM model will easily modify this one, and this leads to strong constraints on this Very, very strong constraints. For example, if you just add a Higgs doublet, extra doublet, this is violated. You don't have to do many great things. Okay? Simple extra Higgs doublet will modify the entire structure. Okay. You are calling this neutral current, which are because it doesn't come from neutral current. A neutral current in the sense that this current doesn't carry any charge. Okay. That current doesn't carry any charge. Okay. Higgs also is chargeless. This is called a charge current because it has a W plus minus. W bosons are called charge current. Neutral currents are like Z boson, photon, or uh, Higgs. These are all neutral currents. Charge Higgs is not a neutral current. The name is because of the mediator. No, the mediator, okay. If you write this current, doesn't carry any charge. Say, for example, U L bar, gamma mu D L bar is equal to some J mu, you call it. This is not carrying any current. This has a current which cancels off. Uh, okay, sorry. This is a charge current, I'm sorry. This is a charge. So this has a charge such that this cancels the charge. So the total should be always chargeless, no? Lagrangian should be chargeless. So this is called charge current. This is called charge current interaction. Now if you do the same thing with the same field, say for example, real power prime dl bar prime z mu this is a neutral current this z mu has no charge or the mediator this also if you write it in terms of another z mu it's a chargeless this is a chargeful this is chargeless so these are because of the rotation no this has nothing to do with rotation so the nomenclature z ah okay w has a specific charge only after rotation. This one. Here you can give it a specific uh, uh, Q, Q value. The Q value is equivalent to its hypercharge if you want. It has T3 is equal to 0. Uh, sorry, T3 is equal to 1. Hypercharge is 0. Sorry, I am being the same mistake again. Hypercharge is equal to 0. Its T value is, uh, is equal. Its Q value is equal to T3.
So there are no flavor changing. Uh, there are no, say for example, um, the case decay to pi. This decay process is mediated by BUS, copy by. And once in a while, they also decay into 3 pi's. Let's say, I'm slowly, but anyway. 
to five ohms and so on. So this is all created by because this process the K meson contains a strange quark. So somehow the strange half quark has to disappear into up and down type quarks. So strange is losing interaction. If you want to lose some flavor, okay. If you want to lose some flavor or change the flavor of any quark or something, you need this flavor changing currents essentially. And these are all mediated by charge currents. <coughs> like for example, 5 plus 5 minus or something. Like that. <coughs> so and so you can have various combinations of this. Now the important point is some of these processes. There are no, while there are no flavor changing uh, tree level process, at the loop level, they are extremely well measured. You can have process which are flavor changing measurements. That means in neutral fermion, neutral scalar. Uh, meson oscillates to another neutral meson which is just its antiparticle. So this is a process which requires a neutral current transition but it is actually not a neutral current, a neutral current like thing which is happening at the loop level through double loop. So this is a very famous process which is K0, K0 power oscillations, okay, K0, K0 power oscillations in which a neutral meson, say a process between two neutral mesons will be mediated by only a neutral mediation, not neutral current. But there are not three level neutral currents in standard mode. But the loop level interactions will mimic a okay, neutral current. These interactions through charge currents will mimic the neutral current. <coughs> so, this is one famous example in which the corresponding oscillation thing are measured of the order of 10 to the power minus 6. Delta MK by MK. MK meaning is a small mass difference between K0 and K0 bar, which requires to oscillate these two phenomena, K0 to K0 bar, K0 to K0 bar. And so this requires some mass difference between these two mesons, and this mass difference has been measured up to the factor of 1 millionth of the mass of the particle. Okay. At, uh, at the tree level, there is no flavor changing neutral current. Yeah. There is a charged current. So, here neutral current uh, There is no neutral current at uh, one loop level also. But this will mimic, if you condense this one, this will mimic like a charged current, uh, like a neutral current. Because at the end of the day, this is a K0 neutral particle, okay. this is another neutral current, neutral particle. So you can write currents in terms of two neutral currents, okay? And we condense this entire bubble. Say for example, we condense the entire bubble. It's like a K zero wave function going to anti K zero wave function through some interaction. And this interaction looks like a neutral interaction, but it's actually a charge current interaction deep inside because there is no vortex. There is no vortex with a charge uh, neutral current which can change flavor. So you cannot have a vortex Z U D which will change flavor. That's the point. There is no vortex with Z P or gamma. This is not a vortex. But at the whole, if you write it in terms of two currents, say for example, some scalar currents, like for example, okay, you can write it as ds bar, ds bar, this entire lagrangian. 
Is it going to work? Is it going to work? But deep inside, you probe this Lagrangian because it's an effective term you are writing in Lagrangian. Okay? D s bar is current, D s bar is current. It's actually W's which are populating this with the UMCs. Okay? So this is one of the terms, if you write it in terms of effectivity, if you integrate, you work in Fermi theory, say, you say that I don't care about standard model. you work in Fermi theory, this is the Lagrangian you write. Singleton current theory, and it's changing field. Because this K0 can decay into something, K0 bar can decay into something, so it change. So this oscillation requires changing flavors. The SD bar going into, it's changing flavors by two units. If you an antiparticle going into a particle, that means uh, strangeness is changing, right? Say so strange is going to anti-strange. So the strange particle has a quantum number, say plus one. Antiparticle has a minus one. So the strangeness quantum number is changing by two units, or strangeness flavor is changing by two units. So, but that's not possible with it. looks like a neutral current at the uh, effective level. But deep inside, it's actually a charge current which is doing it because if you probe the vortex, the probe a W vortex. It's not the Z vortex which comes. This diagram is not possible with a W Z vortex. Z or X or any of these things. So this is one of the strongest constraints coming on flavor. Coming coming on. Any physics beyond standard. Okay? K0, K0 bar, delta mk by mk, okay, will give you one of the strongest constraints. Then, similarly, you have B physics constraints, say B to S gamma. The B meson again changes flavor to the S meson and then generates a photon. Okay, again, this is a W. At the face of it, it looks like a flavor changing current, uh, brutal current, but it's not a flavor changing current as we have discussed. Okay, a B meson. And we came to X. Some excess meaning, I mean, it can be K or anything. Okay? Any strange particle times. So these K physics and B physics, these are the, uh, there are n number of observables. I'm not going into all of them. Okay? But that is a separate lecture on flavor physics and physics and everything. But as people who are looking at physics beyond standard models, we need to consider two strongest constraints. The two strongest constraints are K physics, delta mk by mk, and B physics, this branching fraction, B to S gamma, which is measured as at a very high position. Is there some cutoff or something of the order of 2 to 4 to 10 bar? Between some number of information. Now, there is one something strange about these things. In the standard model, this calculation is not at one loop. Okay, if you do the calculation at one loop, it gives you some number. But then, if you add QCD corrections, that number increases. So you'll have. So normally, what you'll say in perturbation theory, if you add it, do the calculation at one loop, and Two loop will be suppressed compared to one loop, right? Two loop will be suppressed. But in this case, the two loop is larger than one loop because the two loop is coming from QCD. It's not coming from the electronic. Okay? So, if you have gluons coming here, gluons coming here, gluon corrections here, gluon corrections here, and all this, so this is computed at n cube and rho. 
So these QCD corrections are well known and they have some denomination group effects and there are some calculation techniques which are used. Okay, but this idea that uh, I think in the 1980s it was first pointed out that if you add QCD corrections, the branching fraction is actually larger compared to the what is computed in the standard model at one degree. So the QCD corrections play a very, very important role. Now, there is a three loop calculation going on for several years, actually, by Misiak and company, it for QCD. There is an NLO calculation already, he visited us in the department, actually. And there are not many people who can check these calculations also because <laughs> there is only one person or two person in the world who are doing these calculations. These are very, very hard calculations. Okay. But if you want, you can look at uh, there is a PR by Misiak and company who computes this branching fraction in the standard model and it matches very well with the exponent. It's an important point. Okay? It matches very well with the exponent and the theory that uh, the exponent error is smaller than the theory error in this particular case. There is a theory error because now what happens is the computations are done in the B field, in the B, assuming the B quark, but you don't know what is the B quark content in a B meson. Okay, how much is the B quark content in a B meson? So you don't know what is the content in it. So you so there is always some sort of hydraulic uncertainty which comes into the picture in these kind of things. As of now, the exponent is doing much better computatively in this case, even though the computation has been done at very high precision. But it matches very well. It matches still very, very well with the standard model. So, flavor changing neutral currents are a test to check any physics beyond standard model. Any? Yes. So, does that then cannot write a vertex flavor changing? So that is actually a uh, result of this, uh, I mean, the SU2 generator needs diagonal, I mean, the one which you consider as neutral, the combination of the tau matrices and the associated with the W3 minimum, that matrix is actually uh, like diagonal. So right. because of so, that, you cannot. Yeah, so the point is that uh, uh, the yes. left and right are different, but their kinetic terms are also different. Mm -hmm. So they get individually diagonalized. So then it's diagonal. So in the mass basis also, it remains diagonal. In the charge basis also, it's diagonal. So in the mass basis also, it remains diagonal. Okay, just rotation matrices, you can re just replace them uh, by their diagonal counterparts because it just goes through. Except that the kinetic term couplings are different for the left and right counterparts. So the Z couplings are always unitary. Meaning that means there are no flavor changes. Okay. There could be a, there could be exceptions in BSU models. Okay, so this is the take-home message from this part of the standard model. So now let's come to the most interesting part. What do you mean when you say uh, when you say that uh, we don't know the B content of this? Uh, well, what happens is, uh, uh, okay, uh, now what we measure in an experiment is not, uh, when you do the theory calculation, uh, the way you do the quantum theory is that you take these asymptotic states, you assume a big quark and do this calculation at certain moment time and do this calculation at higher order value. Now, B quark is not an asymptotic state in an experiment. Okay, what you see actually in the bound state, B is contained in a, B quark is contained in some B, B bar state or it's a BS bar or something like that, BD bar, typically, like, for example, this is BD bar. This is a bound state. Now, the content, now then, we compute this and then we convert it with something called the structure function. 
Okay, or sometimes called decay constant, sometimes called sometimes it is called FB. Okay, FB tells you what is the probability of finding. It tells you all the information how the B quark is sitting inside a B zone. Then you have convoluted this calculation with the probability of finding B quark with that particular momentum state inside B zone state. So this is called FB. You multiply this, but this FB has large errors. Okay, so it is either computed, but we don't know the FB. Either computed by ladders. Okay, similarly in K physics you have FK. In pi physics you have F pi, pi only K constant. K only K constant. Okay, so FB is an important. So it tells you what is the, because what you see is B, you don't see the B quark. It's a B meson decaying into some other meson and a photon in an exponent. But you are computing with microscopic physics, but then you have to convolute it with the microscopic physics. And D bar will not be important in this case? D bar will not be important, it's like a spectator quark. Actually, D bar will just go like this, whatever else comes. So this gives me DS bar something. Give me important. And I tell you what's the final state. Like a spectator, essentially to what's happening. So depending upon what are the final states, if you you know how to define uh, distinguish a K meson in the in the detector. So you know that there is a K meson which comes in the picture. Now you know you started with the B meson. Now you are seeing whether there is a photon coming in the detector. Okay? So that's all you know. But you are computing with B quarks. Okay? Not with B mesons. Okay? You are computing as the B meson. If you are more careful, you are actually computing with B meson with a certain momentum. So normally in most other cases, cases and other things, you said the external momentum of the quark also to zero. But actually, in this case, uh, the loop functions become more complicated because uh, typically in B factories, the B mesons are boosted in okay, its forward direction. So you put in external momentum non-zero, so the loop functions become slightly complicated. They are not your standard ABC loop functions. Essentially, there are some spence functions and so on. So you compute that. And then, but then you also need to know what is the content of the, how much is the big piece of content in the uh, big quark content in the big piece. Okay, so. The B, uh, this is about table changing the current. <coughs> Any further questions on this side? So, on the left hand sector also, independent of neutral masses, you can also think of some quantities. Okay, these are quantities which have been discussed right from 1950s. So, you don't have any flavor changing neutral currents in the left hand sector also. Independent of neutral current. So, if any new physics which modifies the electronic sector and gives you mu, we will e gamma, which is now the branching fraction, is constrained to 10 power minus 13. Similarly, tau to mu gamma, tau to e gamma, these are all constrained to be of the order of 10 power minus 8. So people thought discovering new particles can be done by flavor changing motor currents because instead of directly producing them, those effects can be uh, understood in terms of their loops. Okay, and once you have a signal for this flavor changing motor current, you can probe the vertex in much greater detail by building a bigger collider. That was the basic idea. So from since 1950s. We would need to search, 
looking for new particles essentially. Okay. Uh, then, uh, so now the number has reduced drastically, but no new particle grew in the electron cell. So, flavor chain in neutral currents play a very, very important role and they are highly suppressed, very small. These are forbidden transitions for quote unquote within the standard model. So, that is a mismatch. At the, they are allowed at the quantum level. Since they are allowed at the quantum level, like I said, they are 1% or 2% of the compared to the branch interaction, or sometimes even 1000. 10,000th percent, like B2 is gone. Okay. They are extremely small okay. and they have to be forbidden in any DSM model. Can you remember the case of leptons? Leptons are See, the point is that in the electronic sector, neutrons are massless. Okay, there is only one newcomer atoms. So, if we have in the hydrogen, let's see the comparison. Say, for example, we have YU, UL bar, DL, H, and then YD, DL bar, DR, H, DL. Now, these are two different matrices. So, the left and left are split because of this matrix. Though they sit in the same cube. Okay? Yeah, UL bar. Oh, sorry. There is only there is only one matrix there. Okay, there is only one matrix. It's near by UL bar ER. Plus H, okay, H. Okay. Now here you don't, you can diagonalize it and you can choose in the L because nu L is degenerate, nu L is degenerate, you can choose your nu L rotation such that it cancels the EL rotation because it's completely free. If something is completely free, uh, it's degenerate. Yeah, any mat rotation matrix will go through. Okay, any rotation matrix. So, so the W vertex <coughs> we have a rotation coming from this one, so this way. Now you say I am rotating my new L also in such a way that this is diagonal. I have that freedom because new L doesn't have a matrix. If it has a matrix, that will give rise to PM minus matrix. If it doesn't have a matrix, I can always go into this basis where I have the freedom to rotate it to be such that it cancels any rotation. Okay. The last part LSSP or LHC. So the LSSP or LHC is very interesting. It contains Science essentially, as they say. <coughs> now, 
No, what I want to do, uh, uh, initially ask the question, uh, what are the quantum corrections in this quantum case? So the Higgs gets quantum correction. Now the main point about this is that in the broken phase, okay, let's go to the broken phase. Okay. Uh, mu x square is completely determined by lambda. It's not a free parameter. It's not a free parameter. It looks like it has two free parameters, but there is only one free parameter. Okay, so you have B is equal to minus mu x square by lambda. <coughs> so if you put a minus sign here, this can be replaced by root lambda up to a factor 2 or something. Put a B by root 2 or whatever. Do you want to agree with this? You know what is root uh, b by root 2? b by root 2 is around 175. So, you know what is lambda value roughly now already because you know mh is essentially 126. So what is the lambda value from standard model? This will call it as lambda standard model. Okay? To distinguish from BSM lab. Okay? We will call it as lambda standard model. So can somebody tell me what is the value of lambda? Standard 0.6, 0.4. Any idea? Do you all agree with this? Okay. It should be squared actually. <coughs> okay. Homework. I know what is the understanding of Okay? Within the error box. Now, in the broken phase, you can replace H with H. Now, so when you replace H with H, so what you have is essentially mu H square x square plus lambda v h q plus lambda so this is your x But let's consider uh, this is in the present phase. Now, typical uh, what we need, okay, I shouldn't write this thing. So when you minimize this, there is a very old trick of minimization, is that if you want to minimize this potential, just replace it by the inverse. If you have more complicated uh, uh, things, so you minimize it. Mu x square, v square, plus lambda v power four. You neglect all the other modes because you are only having the neutral component and the inverse. And so you solve for v. <coughs> this is a trick. This is not completely correct, but it's okay. This works very well.
Now, if you call it as V by L3, you have a different, it's a factor to aggregate the function. Now, if lambda is greater than 0, okay, the condition is that lambda is greater than 0, mu square is negative, then this has some physical value. This has some physical value. If either of these conditions is violated, okay, you won't have any physical value. So what happens when you add quantum corrections? So, okay, so what happens when you add quantum corrections to this? And this V is negative to one is V. You get it indirectly from W mass. From W mass, Z mass, okay, Fermi and mass. Everything is in C. Yeah, there is a from Fermi constant. It's actually related to the Fermi constant, and that's how you get it. So you have a Fermi constant also. The Fermi constant is related to it. Huh? Huh? Is there a cubic term in, in broken phase? In the broken phase, uh, just expand, you know, V plus H. Oh, okay. V plus H holds. So the quantum corrections, let me just write down the quantum corrections. The quantum corrections uh, to the phase are the gauge corrections. We'll only do this still in the next few days after the class. The gauge corrections. Then there are fermion corrections. There are the self corrections. Okay, you can classify them as into three parts. Okay. Self correction. I am just writing one diagram for each of these things. Okay. There are a lot of diagrams. Remember, there are a lot of diagrams. Okay. These are your self corrections. That means corrections proportional to lambda. Corrections proportional to fermion mass, okay, let's take the top part because it's the largest. All the corrections are proportional to the mass of the fermion. So the largest correction is essentially the top mass. And there are the gauge corrections. So you now renormalize the theory. You now renormalize the theory. So the one parameter which you renormalize is actually a lambda. You renormalize a lambda. Okay. Okay. Should I stop now today, or should I continue for the take another twenty minutes or something? Like that? Okay, maybe I'll stop today. I wanted to finish this and one more pop up because of which I missed. I'll take, continue for another 5 10 minutes. Okay, let's uh, you guys are fine, right? I mean, you won't miss your lunch and everything. No. Okay, good. So, this you renormalize lambda and let's call this as lambda physical. Now, there is one technique in field theory called renormalization. So what is does is that so I said there are two things in renormalization. One is regular regression, another is renormalization. So if you renormalize a quantity, say for example, I renormalize lambda, I renormalize it at one particular scale because if you are using dimensional regularization, it introduces some arbitrary scale into the field. Okay, you renormalize it at one scale. But then why choose that particular scale? You can renormalize it another scale also. Okay? So let's renormalize it at scale mu1. Mu1. 
and then there is a renormalization k. Okay. Now you can write an equation which matches a parameter at a renormalization scale mu1 to the parameter at a renormalization scale mu2, and that equation is called the renormalization group equation because it acts like a group, it satisfies all the properties of the group. Okay, this equation is called the renormalization group. <coughs> So when you renormalize the standard model, okay, when you renormalize the Higgs, you are essentially renormalizing the entire standard model. The question you are going to ask is that when you renormalize the standard model, okay, 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 when you renormalize you are uh, getting into unphysical region of V. Okay? Unphysical region of V means all the masses, everything, all your physical, because everything is proportional to V in standard mode, right? The gauge will have W masses, Z masses, fermion masses, everything is proportional to V. So you don't want it to enter any unphysical. Okay, so the question is, you renormalize and up to what scale these renormalized standard models vary is a question that up to what energy scale if you renormalize the renormalizability of the standard model, these conditions are still holding. These conditions are still holding. Earlier, this was done right from the 1980s and there is a precursor for it. <coughs> the precursor is why these people started taking this idea seriously is because there was a precursor. The precursor was again started by a very famous paper by Helen Trin, George I, and Mandel. Okay. What they did was, once they understood that the QCD is also described by a gauge coupling theory, okay, by, by gauge theory, they took the then known values of the gauge couplings, okay, then known values of the gauge coupling and started applying renormalization group equations to them. These were one loop renormalization group. Okay? And then they found one of the very nice features which led to the interesting thing. Right? There is a rough unification, rough unification of these three gauge couplings at some very high scale at that time of the order of 10 power. So, you write the beta functions, the gate, uh, the, okay, uh, I'll explain it a little bit more because this again is very, very important for us. The beta function, so the renormation group equations have a form like this. This is in the early 70s. You all know Helen Quinn? His name sound anything? Yeah, Kache is a guy, Helen is a different woman. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Robert Kache, he passed away. Yeah. Same Helen Quinn. Yeah. Renormalization group equation. So, the renormalization group equation are typically written as. D G I or sometimes D G 
Vi, right? Vi, and then mu. Either way, it's the same thing. You put a mu in the front or a tiny mu comes up and mu. These go as beta i, g i, q. Betas are some numbers. These are called beta. They are beta functions. These beta functions tell you what is the particle content in the theory. If you have a, what is the particle content in the theory, that's how we tell it. But if you have Lecoq planes and stuff like that, <coughs> these have a different name. These are called anomalous derivations. So, what uh, this for? So, the gauge couplings at the one loop level just depend upon themselves. So, these beta functions are also derived by computing the loop diagrams, like what I have shown. Okay, and you can the methods of deriving them. Okay, you derive them, and they can be derived at higher loops, higher loops, also. two loop, three loop, so on. So, so what Weinberg and other guys, when Helen Quinn, Weinberg, and George are other, they come to this simple thing: assume the standard model beta function. Okay, assume the standard model beta functions. Beta functions are dependent upon the. Uh, Particle content of the model, whatever is the particle content, say how many fermions we have, how many left tail, right tail, and so on. So, you compute it, there are general formulas depend, given by number of fermions, number of scalars, and everything. Use this, and what they showed was that if you have plot 1 by alpha i, you'll have roughly something like this. <coughs> Alpha is uh, g i squared by 4 by 2. So the weak coupling is roughly the same, it doesn't matter. The strong coupling falls off because I am plotting 1 by alpha. The strong coupling falls off. The q decoupling grows very slowly. So at scales, this is our logarithmic number, this logarithm is 10 power 15, 10 power 14. At these scales, there is a rough, rough unification like scenario. There is a rough unification like scenario. It's not exact, but there is a triangle in which they are very come very, very, very close by. They come to very close by. So this led to the idea that I can extrapolate even my Higgs couplings and uh, also to high limits, up to very, very high limits. <coughs> now, what happens to the Higgs coupling? So, this was started again by Parsi, you know, Parsi, Roberto Parsi, Parsi, Altarelli, these people, essentially. The same Altarelli Parsi did the same kind of equations for UCD. For the DG lab equations, they also did one of the final uh, started these things in the 1960s, late 70s, and early 80s. Then Miami, these people had written the first papers of calculation. So, what is the consequence of this? The basic idea is that you have a potential like this. Okay, how do you get this thing? It's a combination of Five, uh, pi square, pi power four. Okay, so below one, so below one, you need to add these two, otherwise you won't get something down. Unless the phi square term is negative, you won't get this shape. You plot it in Mathematica and you can just check it. You won't get this shape. <coughs> so 
or I take mu square uh, phi square is equal to negative, mu square is equal to negative. Okay, but then if lambda turns negative, if lambda is equal to zero, okay, if lambda is equal to zero, this potential takes a form again. Lambda is equal to zero, it just becomes phi square. Uh, lambda becomes negative. No, when phi square is equal to lambda is equal to zero. It should be down. Ah, wait, uh, sorry. You are right. <laughs> okay. But keeping mu square negative, sorry. What happens when lambda goes to negative? So the question was, what is the shape of the potential with higher energies? Whether you are restoring this shape, because this shape is important because you want to sit here. And this should be a very, very stable point because the universe should remain there. Okay, the universe should always remain in the lowest energy state. And the lowest energy state cannot keep moving here and there. Okay, there has to be one state. Okay, it has to be one state. Today I say my lowest energy state is here, then tomorrow I take some steroids and move up. No, it's not possible actually. Okay, so the lowest energy state should be already here, so it should not move. So, but <clears throat> is it possible? by somehow that I change, I restore the symmetry. Now this state, this potential will have, what will have? It has no stable configuration at all. It lower, there is no lower energy state essentially. It is highly unstable because if I do a small perturbation here, it will fall off this way or that. Okay, I need to sit here, I need to do a small perturbation and it should remain there. Okay, under small but if I do a stability analysis. So is it that possibility that from this potential, I go into this potential or not? That means the vacuum disappears from a non-zero value and goes back to its zero value. So what happens if it happens to go to zero value? The symmetry is restored. The returning symmetry is not broken. Okay. So for that, I need to know how my lambda is changing with energy. The crucial thing is how my lambda is changing with energy. Whether it's running very fast. What is the role lambda is playing? <coughs> so the when Alterini and company have started looking at this thing. At that time, there was no Higgs mass, there was no top mass, there was no alpha S very well accurately. <laughs> okay? And so they started playing around with all these things as free parameters and then the okay? They started looking at when you can have uh, symmetric restoration or when the universe will be unstable, when the, uh, the potential will become unstable. So they started putting some very, very weak bonds on the stability of the things. Extremely weak bonds. But they started it, what, from 30 years ago, 30, 30 years. Now, after the Higgs has been discovered, the amount of uh, precision we have is just unbearable. OK? 
Okay. So what we have is we already have two loop beta functions. I just cite two papers which are very really important actually. <coughs> Now, so what we, so before Higgs, okay, I should spare to before Higgs, the unknown quantities were MH, which essentially means lambda, MT, MT was known, but there are large error parts, okay, large, delta MT is a very, very large error bar, say for example, okay, MH, MT, alpha s errors and most of the analysis were done at one loop level of okay one loop level with zero thresholds and stuff like that later on people were doing two loop rg plus one loop thresholds what are these threshold corrections that means in a way, you can think that threshold corrections are to make everything at scheme or in single scheme. Say, for example, if you are writing your gauge couplings in MS bar, okay, and you are calculating your loop correction, I mean masses in on shell scheme. Now you want to compute, you want to convert the beta functions or uh, the anomalous dimensions of the Yukawa couplings also into MS bar. So you have to apply some threshold corrections at the scale of the mass essentially, at the scale of the particle, where you are adding the mass. One loop threshold corrections and so on so on. But now we have three loop RG for most two loop thresholds. And most importantly, we have the Higgs mass. MT also pretty well, small. Alpha S errors, small. Okay. So there is a drastic technological as well as experimental information which has included. Meaning now you have, so these are all these bits and pieces which people have computed it electronic. I told you, right? Electronic two loop renovation is not done fully. Okay, so people have done bits and pieces. RGs were known for three loops. Okay, so they used this entire technology to bring it up to the best possible. So what they found <coughs> is that your lambda, so T lambda, I can show you the equation for. Okay, if you can see the equation of the T lambda. There is three loop. Okay. <laughs> okay. There is a three loop. Okay. Now, when you do all that, so what happens is that how do you do this thing? How do you do this? Is that you still take the potential. Now, you take, try to get the, get the shape of the potential with all the uncertainties at every scale, say for example, say for mu is equal to, say mz, you start with mu square is equal to mz square. Then it will have some error parts. So this potential will be some thick line. Now when it has some thick lines, 
what happens is that the minima could be here, they could be in the other part here, there could be a deeper minima here. Okay, in the range of parameters. Imagine that this is a thicker one. I am assuming, okay, because of all these corrections, uncertainties, and everything, this will be not here. Thing, it will be a step. So you may have a minima, you may think this is your standard one minima. But there could be something deeper here. But the physics should always, or the shape could change a little bit here. It's a little bit deeper. Okay. So you may say this is more deeper, this is not my deeper minima. So the inwards will not remain here. It will start here, slowly decays because it will always go to a deeper minima and it will reach here. Now this transition time you can compute it. There are various reasons and everything. You can compute this transition time. It is done by Coleman and company the first time in the field. Okay, using tunneling-like techniques and everything. <coughs> so you do the same tunneling-like techniques. So this is a very famous method by Coleman. Okay, you can compute these transition times. So, you classify a vacuum as something stable if it is the deepest minima at that time. Meaning globally it is the deepest minima for that energy, for that scale of parameters. Okay, stable, deepest minima. Unstable. <coughs> That means the potential changes shape for those parameters. It just becomes something like this or something like that. Okay, like what we are saying. Okay. <clears throat> Unstable. Minima not plausible. Or the other option is <clears throat> it decays very fast. It decays very fast to that product, that minima, that region of the parameter, for that region of the parameter space, it decays very fast to a decays fast to a deeper minima. Okay. Uh, for a given scale and for a given set of parameters. Yes. It's stable and this transition and this decay is with respect to what? Decay is uh, meaning with respect to one point in the one minima to another minima. Uh, and in some duration? Uh, so uh, the duration is set for the lifetime of the universe. Transition. Okay. So you compute the transition time. It is essentially some exponential for some action of the theory. Okay. <coughs> And so we compute that. Now there is a third version which is metastable. Metastable, this is answer to this question. Metastable means that it's not the deepest minima, but the decay to the deepest minima is much, much, the transition time to the deepest minima is much, much longer than the lifetime of the universe. So, for all practical purposes, it's put up stable. Because the lifetime of the universe is 10 power 40 billion, uh, 10 power 18 billion years. Okay. 10 power 18 seconds or what? <laughs> okay. okay, 14 billion years, or how many seconds you want in terms of this thing. Okay. Meta stable is uh, not deepest minima. Lifetime much much greater than age of the universe. So now you ask the question 
when do you hit the first unstable point? So when does lambda start becoming negative? Or when does lambda, at what scales, lambda starts becoming negative? So you explore this one. So you, what you do is you start with big scale. <coughs> start with big scale. Now you see the gauge couplings. You know they have already drawn this figure. So lambda at the big scale is around 10 power minus 2 or something like that, 0.2 or something for example. As I said, this depends upon the 1 by 2 factor. It goes, now the 0 is somewhere here. Y top is much smaller. Not negative, it's point very close to zero. So then the lambda starts going around the scale. At the scale of 10 power 10 GV, lambda becomes negative. Now this is with error bars and everything. So what is this point to? Hey, this is not nicely drawn, but <laughs> it is more like a snake, but it's just smooth name. Yeah. What, what is this two uh, two lines? No, no, these are not two lines, sorry. They don't mean any hey, hey, hey. So this is plan scale. Sorry, you should touch this line. Okay, okay, let me draw it nicely. This is zero. Unstable. So it is close to intermediate range. Now, this of course depends upon how many thresholds you have, okay, how much level you have, how much particular. So people have claimed, the recent paper claims that lambda can be made zero, not at 10 power 10, but close to Planck scale. So, it, okay. <coughs> but here they, uh, the main result is that already at 10 power 10, you have a parameter range which starts touching uh, unstable point. So if, if uh, the, I mean, the weapon becomes unstable at 10 power 10 GMA, mm -hmm. will it affect us? Uh, I mean, will it, uh, yeah, you can compute the lifetime, but anyway. But yeah, but it will not affect us. I will be, uh, but the lifetime is uh, 10 for 143 million years or something like that. Okay. But at our scale, it, it can still be stable. I tell you, it's still at our scale. Yeah, it's still positive. Mm -hmm. We assume that all the values at 10 for 2 are our standard values. That is, assuming it's a stable state. Mm -hmm. But when you consider, say, for example, if you have a collider which is hitting at uh, 10 for 10 G. Okay, or if you have very high neutron stars or some very highly energetic astrophysical processes or some multi TV jets or something which are hitting each other and they reproduce some 10 for 10 G. But in those things, electronic symmetry may be unstable. It could produce some, it could cause.
was part of some universities or something. Uh, I didn't. I loosened my mouth and so <laughs> okay. In those things, the lambda could be negative. That means you know, the electronic symmetry is like uh, it corresponds to an unstable. What it means? What it means physically? That's the question if you're asking. Uh, uh, it may uh, okay. The interpretation is unstable. Just that uh, the potential is unstable, so it's unphysical region. Okay, it could lead to some unphysical region or something. So that means you take it as an indication for new physics. It cannot be unphysical. So I put in some new particles. So I use it. That's the simplest explanation. But then, the scale of like new physics, we also have to work here. Yeah. It can be at weak scale so that it modifies. Uh, the Brani okay. That point, I mean, shifts further. Yeah. Now, if you are adventurous, you can give a statistical interpretation of multiple universes. Then look at criticality and heat space transition and everything. That I won't enter now. Okay? Yeah. Because you know that this is exactly like a phase transition. And you can compute uh, critical, critical values. I, I gave you two references. Right? One of them actually works or talks about universality of this uh, critical exponents, and then whether the universe can be modeled in terms of sand dunes. Multiple universes can be modeled in terms of sand dunes, and so on and so. But uh, I will not talk about it. For me, it's an indication of new physics. Let's just say. Let's start with the simplest explanation. It could be an indication. Of you can go up the scale, but it will be negative. It's all unstable. So now, if you build a granite factory like what she was asking, that theory will have a standard model case unless you modify the couplings and put extra matter or something, which will be unstable. But uh, I mean, at lower scale, we have not written down all possible couplings, right? And high energies may be those things. So yeah, yeah. See, it could happen. Like, a theory, when you extrapolate to high energy, so for example, if you only have Fermi theory, okay, if you only have Fermi theory and no standard model, it will have some weird behaviors. Okay, like for example, if you do a simplest thing like in Fermi theory, if you do neutron electron scattering and start extrapolating with high energy, it starts growing with high energy and it just blows up. But you know that neutron electron scattering cannot blow up. Okay, but but now you consider that after certain energy you put in W mass and everything, and now everything will be neutral. Okay, so it only totally tells you that there is some fault with the theory, the theory is not complete. Okay. And we don't have to worry about multi universes as of now. Okay. <laughs> okay. <coughs> so there is still one thing which is left. After discussing all this at the quantum level, <coughs> uh, there is one more feature of the standard model at the quantum level which I discuss briefly and then I will proceed to talk about uh, deficiency of the standard model, which is anomalies, which you cannot just see at the um, quantum level, at the Lagrangian level, at the using the cla classical Lagrangian. I will talk about anomalies for a few minutes and then I'll proceed with about deficiency of the standard model. Now, why? Okay, now I want you to guys to look into this paper. Okay, there are, these are nice papers. If you are unable to find out, so if you want, there is this nice figure <coughs> which I want you to see. Suppose if I demand, you can do various things. You can demand that the standard model is stable all the way up to. A set Planck scale and everything. So you'll get a condition such that the Higgs mass should be in metastable region. Okay, you can put some conditions upon what is the mass of the Higgs should be such that it should always be stable all the way up to so on and so forth. So you can play with these games, you can play absolute stability requirement and so on and so forth. So I want you to look at figure three and study this in this paper. Okay. Figure three in this paper, which is uh, 13. 073552. Okay? That's your assignment essentially. Just look into that figure 
There it tells you at depending upon up to what scale you demand your okay, where your parameter should lie. If you what care scale you demand your stability, metastability, or something. It looks likely according to this analysis that we are in a metastable region. Seems to be the most uh, favorable scenario. Okay. But uh, we'll see because the calculations have to be done, there will be some new designs. Maybe the W mass is not the same. <laughs> okay, we don't know. <laughs> okay. So one has to say essentially. Okay. Now, and those who are interested more in the consumer like scenarios, like phase transitions and everything, look at the last chapter. It's not very educative, but look at the last chapter on criticality, level criticality issues. And comparing the sand dunes and everything. Yeah, I didn't want to talk about it. Maybe if I take a second time this course, I'll talk about it. <laughs> the first time. <laughs> the first time, I think we'll stick to one in words. <laughs> then we'll not stick to multiple words. Yeah, any further questions on this? Okay. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs>